uh, one night, this is after I came out or after he found out, um, I was at the front door and, um, he was kind of like shaking and like, there was something wrong here. And I'm like, well, am I allowed back in here? And, um, he had his gun and he started to put it in my direction. And I was just like, all of a sudden I felt this sense of calm and I was just like, I think he's going to kill me. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 The other factor, which I didn't know till years later, was that my father really had uh, severe sleep apnea. And he would maladapt to his apnea by taking in uh, more calories. Uh, he ended up, well, at one point, just before I was born, he quit uh, smoking, picked up food, and it just compounded. And then he had all these comorbidities, which developed into type 2 diabetes, which was starting to get out of control. And sleeping disorders with police work are not uncommon based on the fact that we have constant disruptions with our circadian rhythms. So that compounded with the fact that he had uh, undiagnosed apnea um, would just create this little monster. So he had like an addic addictive personality, kind of? Like, what, did he drink or no he wasn't much of a drinker um but he definitely and i don't want to get too clinical but like his mood dysregulation like like where he'd be up and down and like the like anger moments where you, you if you if you came in and and at the wrong time you might you know catch a catch a swing but as a as a boy knowing something's going on that's that you're 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 uh, different from what your friends are looking at that had to be horrifying well that's why i was like he is i am never ever <laughs> gonna come out to going him. to tell him anything um about me um <clears throat> no black people could come in the house definitely no gay men i i i um, I, I i dealt with that too all right so i and i'm like okay sure the other thing was don't get a girl pregnant and I'm like, oh, thank God, I didn't know I got that one down. <laughs> Not a chance, Dad. <laughs> you know, Dad. <laughs> Fine. These Deal. Rules. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably uh -oh. the most um, shaping of, of when I felt most comfortable to come out or not come out, and I didn't. And then my, my friend, is like, who ended up telling my parents, uh, yeah, I know who, where Matt's with, who he's with, and these two guys they met on the internet, and he's gay. So your friend outed you? She she um, it's she, always a woman. Yep. It's always a woman. Well, <laughs> root of all evil. I told her originally, I said, if something happens, here's where I am. Here's where I am. Who here's who I'm with. Father's complete denial, thinking that I was, you know, brainwashed. It's just a phase. Just a phase. And um it w clearly it wasn't, but he was in, in, in a position where this just is not possible. Um, it's funny. See, your, your father said, don't get a girl pregnant and don't bring black people into the house. The rebellious me. Oh, yeah. Would have got a black girl pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. You know what? There, there is something to that where it's like, you know, if you told, if you told me that, you know, don't touch the stove. It's You're going to touch it. Right. I didn't even think about the stove being there until yeah. you mentioned it. Well, it's hard for a parent to wrap their head around. And, and when and Mark and Ashley are in here, we talked about this because I believe their parents are saints. What they put their parents through is, is uh, things of nightmares. But when you have a child, you just want the best life for the child. And you got to remember, our parents grew up in an era yeah. where homosexuality was not a very popular thing. And it was a very difficult life. I, rem I recall this. I've said this many times on this show. My grandfather, who I believe was a very enlightened man, said, yeah. he, he said, don't be hard on, pe on gay people. And I'll tell you why. Because they didn't choose that lifestyle. It's a very, at the time, it was a very difficult lifestyle. And you don't choose a difficult lifestyle. You don't make your life harder. Life's hard enough. And I always thought that was was a very profound yeah. thing to say. And this was this was a guy who grew up, you know, he was born in 1913. So, but you know, just just getting back to one thing you said, the parents want kids to live their best lifestyle, right? That is their best lifestyle, or the path of is least it, resistance. Is it, is it I mean, the, there's a few. Is it the parents' thought of a good lifestyle, yes. or is it the child's thought of a good lifestyle? It is always the parents' thought of yeah, a good lifestyle. Exactly, they live vicariously. Or they already have been around the block once or twice and know, like, hey, if this, if you choose this, this is what you're going to experience. If you choose that, 
this is likely what you're going to experience. I mean, growing up in the 80s, my parents clearly saw what was happening throughout the AIDS epidemic and just how marginalized LGBT, LGBT but particularly gay men, were going through. Um, yeah, we talked so, about that because AIDS was a gay, gay man's disease. Yeah, exactly. Right. It wasn't really till Ryan White story kind of hit that, you oh know. Oh, my God, the, I the, forgot the, about Ryan White. Oh, I mean, there, there's certain things that if it happens to certain people, then all of a sudden, now it's in your backyard. Now it's something that matters. Greg Luganis, then, remember the yeah, Olympic but, diver? Yeah. But Greg Luganis is gay, Johnson, though, right? Magic Johnson, all of these yeah. things. Greg Luganis is gay, but Arthur Ashe. Ash. Arthur Ashe was another one. Yeah. Um, the guy who played Predator. I don't know his name. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he did blood transfusion. And all of a sudden, everybody got real scared because, hey, as long as it's kept to this sect, which isn't a popular yeah. sect at the time, it's okay. It's okay. Right. It's not a big threat. But then when it became a big threat to the, the masses, now you're like, oh, shit. Now it's us. Now it's us. So your parents found you at this house. Yeah. Uh, well, I had to <laughs> go to uh, a local police station to be uh, picked up and then brought over well, back home. How old were you at this point? I was like 16. Yeah. Wow. So, Knocking socks with two guys. That'll happen. No, I wasn't. Oh, you just hanging out? Yep. Is this air quotes hanging out? No. Or just hanging out? No, it was just, it was literally. <laughs> was it hanging out? <laughs> nothing like that. But, nothing like that. I wanted to be like... I didn't want to be in my neighborhood or close by because if I was, then you would be found out. So, you know, one of the things that I would always try to figure out is how do you out yourself far enough away from home so that you it won't come back to bite you or that it can't find you. And it just so happened, you know, my... Your play, best lane plans. I, I, <laughs> I was actually at work that day. I worked in a tuxedo store and I left early. And for some reason, my parents had to come to the... Uh, to the store to like drop off a jacket, and then we found that I wasn't there. The whole story unraveled. Oh damn! So had it not been cold that night, I might have had a completely different trajectory in my childhood development when it came to this particular issue. <laughs> Did your parents ever accept you over time? Oh yeah. Okay. But it took many, many years. I went many years without talking to my father, so like a, like a, a, a void of silence throughout. The remainder of my high school, a majority of my college. Real in high school, so you're still living at home, and they're not talking to you. I and I'm trying to find a way to be not home. Okay. I joined the rescue squad, and that's when I kind of got my first introduction to emergency services. And uh, at that time, I don't know if they still call them this, or maybe it's a it just where I was uh, on the job. Um, being an EMT, but they called it blue night, blue light split specials. Yeah. Okay. So they still do Jolly that. volleys, blue lighters. Yeah. Right. So, um, I was doing it actually to just have a place to stay on a Friday and Saturday night. And uh, clearly I'm picking up some skills and I became an EMT, but I was really doing it to just not be home. A little escape. It, it was escapism, but I was at Safe least place. doing it adaptively. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't, and they, they struggle with it, and they go through the throes of alcoholism and yeah, drug addiction. Absolutely. Was there ever once that, that internally you said, God, if I could just change this about myself, oh, my course. parents would be more accepting? Absolutely. And did you ever try? No. Um, or was it a rebellious thing? You're like, well, screw you. I'm not trying at all now. It, this has nothing to do with rebellion. I mean, why would anybody put themselves through yeah. this? No, no, I'm not like, saying I'm not saying it's about it's about rebellion. No, the fact that if you have this in you, where you say, if I could just change this one thing, my parents would accept me a little bit more. Um, I knew I knew it wouldn't change, so I did everything I could to try to make them proud of me in other ways. You mm. overcompensate. Yeah, it's like all right. Well, I'm first in this, president of that, first of this. You know, great here. People love me funny guy, all these things that people seem to draw you in so that when that hammer comes down, you know, if, but if it, it, look at the list of good. Right. And look at the it's list like, of what right. you think is bad. Right. Now, now you said your father, you didn't talk to him. How, how was your mother, your mother? Uh, and, she was caught in the middle and of it. And do you have siblings? I do. I have one sister. She's uh, three and a half years older than me. Was she a little bit more open to it? Uh, my mom and my sister were kind of like, yeah, they, they were certainly more Less unaccepting, and then you know the the shock wasn't as bad. Um, yeah, his, his but, but my father really went through a so tough time. His, his sister felt safe bringing her friends over. Then I <laughs> think I, I oh, think, she's off the hook. <laughs> I think every parent has had a conversation at one time, whether they like to admit it or not. You know, you have a baby boy or a baby girl. 
and you have your spouse there. And I know me and my wife have spoken about it. I'll, I'll tell you very openly and honestly. It's like, well, what if he's gay? And I remember my wife asking me that question. I said, as long as he's not a Yankees fan, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm uh, good. I'm good. Because you know, a Yankees fan will get him thrown right out of my house. I think I think every wife asks that question. Yeah. When, when I had my son, my, my ex-wife said, you know, what if he's gay? I said, I'm still going to love him. Yeah. It's my son. Yeah. So, <laughs> what was that movie, Corky Romano? But a lot of, I mean, you know what, though? Unfortunately, a lot of parents do say that, but deep down, some of them don't. They're going to say that to their friends. Like, I would always love my kid. No, I know <laughs> a lot of people. That uh, turn away their children. Oh yeah, but I, I never see their, their parents I, I after they come you, out. I can tell you with full confidence, there is not a thing in the world that would make me turn away my child. There's just nothing in the world that is fathomable to to mm. do that. I don't care if they if they kill somebody, I'm going to help them hide the body. That's the way it goes uh, because they're my boys, yeah. and I'll love them no matter what. And guess what? I would sit in a jail cell for them so they didn't have to experience that. That's that's my way of thinking, and I, I can say with full confidence, I would not be that guy. Yeah, it's Yankees fan. That's so. Different. So, so in other words, if I did something like that, Kevin, I'm a Yankee fan, so Kevin would die me right out. There he is, officer, right yep, there. Yep, he's right there. I'd be like, <laughs> here's the pitch. Take him. Of, I don't want to say he did it, but he is a Yankees fan, and that usually means that. And the Yankees come in and steal Christmas presents. Isn't yes, they do. I tell my kids that. I tell my kids that. So the you 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 want to overachieve. You want to make your parents proud. All right. You cuz you know it's inevitably going to happen somewhere or another. Every kid kid knows eventually this conversation is going to happen. So um it almost it, it puts people into like a fork in the road and they got to figure out what they're going to do. They're either going to be living their authentic self early on without building up everything else, credentials, grades, money, whatever it is, or do you live uh w with this kind of with the hopes that now yeah, maybe they'll eventually come around. So, and you got to figure out when that time might be. So you, you test the waters. You, maybe you'll bring over a friend that happens to be gay and just see how that works. Or um, like a lead balloon in my house. Not, or, not my parents' house, not my house. You, you do something to test the waters. I didn't have to do that. I knew exactly what the waters were. They were completely tumultuous. <laughs> you know, they were shark infested. You would be eaten alive. Muddy not waters. a chance. So when you when you tried to become a police officer, mm. was that psychologically a little jab to your dad? Like, yeah, even though I'm gay, I can still do that job and I can do it well. That, you know, that's actually a good question. You wonder if when your parents tell you don't do something, if that's exactly what you want to do. But it was always in the back of my mind to do something in public service or, you know, not to be behind a desk, so to speak. Well, when you got on it, it was there was different reasons to take the job than there is today. It's more of a service oriented calling. I think it, it still was for me then. I mean, I got back, I got on in 2002. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, now, okay. Now's a little different. It's you, they're, they're oh, today, high, high yeah. salaries. It's a business. You get a good, you know, you, you do. Well. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Right. As far as, uh, you know, money or, or the, the stability of, 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 of having a constant paycheck, which um, I have, uh, that was a motivating factor because I had the chance of being homeless. I didn't know if my father was like, you're done. You're out. Goodbye. You know, you bring an F in this house, I'll shoot him. He, he would say things like this. You can say the word if you want. Yeah. I like, I, I, I prefer when he went, when he was, when, when, when he was at his worst and I meet his worst, um, he was still on the job. And, uh, one night, this is after I came out or after I found out, um, I was at the front door and, um, he was kind of like shaking and like, there was something wrong here. And I'm like, well, am I allowed back in here? And, um, he had his gun and he started to put it in my direction. And I was just like, all of a sudden I felt this sense of calm and I was just like, I think he's going to kill me. And I didn't care. So I walked closer to him. I said, just do it. Just do it. And I called the bluff. And then he started to cry a little bit. He dropped the gun and I walked out of the house. Wow. God damn. 16. <sighs> but the thing is this. Now, should I have done that? Of course not. But What are you going to do, run away, though? It'll shoot you in the back. The other, the other option was to constantly figure out for my entire life, what else am I going to do here to manage my life? 
So I would always be looking for other support networks because my family was a possibility that they would just not be there. So it was a rescue squad. It was a volunteer service that would keep me overnight. It was a church. It was friends' houses. Um, it was anybody that might be something to just give me shelter, to give me some sense of stability. I knew I had some form of worth. I knew it was something I had to give to the world. Just give me a couple of years to get on my feet. And then once I got into college, I was just like, I'm out of this place. Like this, this is, I can finally do what I want. I could be who I want to be. I can spread my wings. I can prove him wrong. And a lot of that ended up coming to true where it's like, did I do this on purpose? Now, this is the point at which I said, because he said it, um, at one point, you'll never be anything without me or without us. Um, and I presume that he felt that there's no way that a child is going to be able to support themselves or survive, especially after coming out. So he felt it would almost force me back into some form of heterosexuality. Yeah. Um, and I was like, thank you very much. Now I'm going to prove you wrong. So l let me ask this question, because uh, so you just said something there that, that kind of little resonated with me. He said these things to you. Being so far removed from that situation, do you think it was his attempt, because he felt like he was losing his boy, okay. and, he, and he felt like he was losing his boy when you, be, when you told him you were gay or it came out that you were gay. He felt like he was losing his boy. And being a police officer for as long as you have been, you know a lot of us are control freaks. We have to control situations. And a lot of times we, we're forced to control situations. He was a police officer. Just to give you some compassion, I'm not excusing his behavior, but, you know, he thought he was losing you. And he that yeah. was his last ditch effort. And he probably didn't have the tools that you have in order to deal with. Oh, he now that I look back at him, like he has so many other things going on. Ex minus me being gay. There, there were so many other problems he had going on with his health. Mm. Um, and. I wish I knew back then all of those things, like what was happening to him. Um, and Could I would have been, have been maybe a little more sympathetic. I would have been a feelings. lot more compassionate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and he just then when I finally, when I graduated college and I, I got on the job immediately, it was, it was just like four year degree, got it. I get, I get a call the next day. Literally. Did he finally go, hey, maybe this gay thing isn't so bad. <laughs> it seems to be working out really good for Matt. He sits me down. Um, and he's like, we need to talk. And, I'm, you know, we, we, we broke bread. But um, and we went back in time to when I was like seven or eight or nine years old. Um, when I first started telling him, you know, what is it like to be a police officer? Or maybe I would want to be one one day. And keep in mind, a nine year old. Right? Um, he said, son, if you become a police officer. You are going to see things that most people never should see. And you're going to see some of the worst in human in, in humanity. Then you have to leave police headquarters and meet the public. <laughs> Damn, that's there is no truer statement yeah. than what your father just said. But for a nine year old to hear that, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. What does that mean? Crabs in a barrel. Right? So, I, but I remembered it. So he told me that again, and he said, "You have to be very careful." I didn't want to become who I became. And I used to make fun of people like you. I used to, all the, all the guys in my department did. We used to make fun of gay cops all the time, especially the ones that were straight. So I'm like, now is this, that was one of the most ignorant statements I ever heard. But what he really meant was, it's the temperament that they were really going after. It's the, the hypermasculinity that is required. It's almost as if your sexuality doesn't matter as long as you fit the image and can do the job. Well, if you think about it, so you, like I, like I said before, you have a very calming, de-escalating voice. You know in the gay community there are certain gay men that roll their asses and are effeminate. Yeah. You, know, you know what I'm talking about. So can you imagine, I don't, I don't, I don't want to... I presume uh, he thought that that would inevitably be my... Yeah. Destiny, or that's you what get, I, you're, down pulling down over, you're pulling over a car and you're saying it in an effeminate voice. Nobody's going to take you seriously, and it was probably a real fear of his. Um, that it would be a switch, like all of a sudden your voice would elevate and you'd be gesturing with your hands more and say I'm, fabulous twice, <laughs> you know, say fabulous quite a bit, right? 
The, these are fears that were uh, he, he had to see not happen over time in order to accept that it's okay. I have a, a masculine now, when, son. Once he once he got through that, worked through his own issues because whatever was wrong in your relationship seemed uh -huh. to be a lot on it was on him. Once he worked through that stuff, was there any any type of regret? in there that he reacted the way that he did in certain scenarios? 